United Kingdom Court jails former Deputy Senate President of Nigeria, Ike Ekwir Madu, his wife and a doctor for an organ trafficking plot. Police grant administrative bill to suspended Adamawa State Resident Electoral Commissioner, Udu Yunusa Ari. Second batch of about 130 persons evacuated from Sudan arrived Nigeria. On the foreign scene, World Health Organization says COVID-19 no longer represents a global health emergency. Good evening, this is News at 7 on Western Spring Television. My name is Tunde Ido. A United Kingdom court has sentenced former Deputy Senate President of Nigeria, Ike Ekwirimadu, to nine years and eight months in prison for an organ trafficking plot. The court also sentenced his wife Beatrice to four years and six months, while the medical doctor who acted as a middleman in the plot, Dr. Obina Obeta, was sentenced to 10 years and his medical license was suspended. Their conviction was the first verdict of its kind under the Modern Slavery Act. In March 2023, the jury found that they criminally conspired to bring a 21-year-old Lagos street trader to London to exploit him for his kidney. The organ was needed for Senator Equirimado's sick daughter, Sonia, who was initially accused of being a part of the crime, but was later cleared of the same charge after jurors deliberated for nearly 14 hours. The young man was said to have been falsely presented as Sonia's cousin in the field bid to persuade doctors to carry out an $80,000 private procedure at the Royal Free Hospital in London. The applicable starting points are custodial sentences of 10 years in the case of Abina Abeta, 10 years and 6 months in the case of E.K. Ekramadu, and 6 years in the case of Beatrice Ekramadu. Abina Abeta, stand up please. There are aggravating features in your case. You deliberately targeted a victim who was particularly vulnerable due to his young age, his isolation from his immediate family, and his poverty. After the conspiracy to exploit C was thwarted, you continued to try and find another person to be exploited in the same way. As against that, you have no previous convictions, and you are a person of good character. The Court of Appeal in Abuja has upheld the conviction and eight-year sentence imposed on the former chairman of the pension reform tax team, Abdul Rashid Mayna, for laundering about 2.1 billion naira. Delivering the ruling, a three-member panel unanimously affirmed the judgment read by Justice Okon Abang of the Federal High Court, Abuja, convicting and sentencing him on November 8, 2021. In the lead judgment, Justice Alfreda Williams Daudu affirmed the various interlocutory rulings delivered in the course of the trial at the Federal High Court, which Mina appealed against. The judge who resolved the two issues identified for determination against Mina held that the appellant was not denied fair hearing by the trial court and that the prosecution provide, proved its case beyond a reasonable doubt. In the meantime, the Nigerian Police Force has confirmed that the suspended Adamawa State Resident Electoral Commissioner Udu Yunusa Ari has been granted administrative bail. Mr. Yunusa Ari has been in custody for interrogation by the police in the course of investigations into allegations of impropriety during the supplementary governorship election in Adamawa State. In a statement today, police spokesperson Muiwa Adijabi said an investigation is still ongoing on the Rex actions during the Adamawa governorship election. Mr. Adijabi said he is expected to report at the police headquarters every weekday. On April 16th, Mr. Yunusa Ari caused controversy by declaring Aisha Binani Dahiru of the All Progressive Congress APC as the winner of the election when the collation of the results was yet to be completed. The Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, subsequently declared the announcement null and void and summoned the REC to its headquarters in Abuja. Governor of Adamawa and candidate of the People's Democratic Party, PDP, Amadou Fintiri, was eventually declared 
winner of the election. <coughs> In other news, the second batch of about 130 persons evacuated from Sudan arrived in Nigeria this afternoon. They arrived at the Inambi Azikiwe International Airport in Abuja around 3.30 p.m. aboard the Taco Airline aircraft. They included 128 females and two males. Nigerians in Diaspora Commission Itcom had earlier revealed that the evacuees spent an estimated 7 hours 30 minutes to get home. In other news, a retired Deputy Secretary General of the Nigerian Union of Teachers, Wale Oyebi, has called for the enforcement of renewable license for teachers in Nigeria as part of regulating the teaching profession. This follows claims by the Teachers Registration Council of Nigeria, TRCN, that 70% of private school teachers in the Southwest region are unqualified. Toby Sanusi has more on this. About 2.3 million teachers in Nigeria are captured in the database of Teachers Registration Council of Nigeria, TRCN. But out of the statistics, 70% of teachers in private schools in Oshun, Oyo, Lagos, Undo, Ogun, and Kwara State are not registered. The TRCN in its latest report described the teachers under this category as cheaters adding that they are not qualified to be registered with the body. However, few educationists like Wale Oyebi, a retired Deputy Secretary General of the Nigerian Union of Teachers, says many teachers in private schools are not registered under the TRCN, owing to the low remuneration they are being paid. You know, the fact is when you look at it, the majority of them, they are, they are handed less. Some of them, some of those proprietors, they don't pay much. Mr. Oyebi noted that TRCN as a regulatory body for teachers should be saddled with the responsibility of enforcing compulsory renewable license for teachers in Nigeria, a situation he says has not been practicable in the teaching system. The TRCN so have the certificate now you give it to teachers, so we have time lag, two, two years, three, three years. That's what other professors are doing. After that, all teachers, once, once your professional license, once it laps, you re, you re, 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 re again. However, many have decried the trajectory of secondary school certificate owners teaching in some private schools. But a school administrator in Oshun State, Oyin Konsola Omigbodo, while speaking on the criteria of employment in private schools, says applicants are placed on strict academic scrutiny in our school before being employed to teach, adding that priority is placed on applicants with BA, BED, and BSc. For instance, um, first of all, I make sure that I don't even take um, so many NCE holders um, I, and I made that decision because I found that the quality of NCE holders nowadays does not measure up and so what I do is I ask, um, I employ teachers who are degree holders who have um, what we call a postgraduate diploma in education and sometimes teachers that we employ do not have postgraduate diplomas. We encourage them to go back to do a part-time program and many of them have since done that and have their TRCM registration as well. So what I do is to ensure that you are a graduate. That's the, that's the least benchmark. And then I also take, sometimes I do take HND holders, higher national diploma holders, but with um, the postgraduate diploma in education in view, I take those. Meanwhile, Thomas Akumalafe, who is a ward chairman of the National Association of Proprietors of Private Schools, NAPS, in Oshun State, countered TRCN statistics, claiming that 95% of teachers in the private schools in Oshun State are qualified. He added that priority is given more to orders of National Certificate of Education, NCE. Presently in Oshun State, which I belong to Oshun, I have not seen uh, something of that, but let me say 5%. But 95% in our various school they are qualified. Five percent might not be qualified since we are we are uh, individual differences, but 95% they are much uh, qualified. According to the Nigerian Union of Teachers, the minimum teaching qualification in Nigeria is the National Certificate of Education. Toby Sanusi, Western Spring Television News. A total of 2,253 textbooks sponsored by the Tertiary Education Trust Fund have been distributed to public, federal and state colleges of education in the country. 
The books were written by scholars of the Nigerian Academy of Education at the book distribution during the 25th conference of the Nigerian Academy of Education in Abuja. Executive Secretary of Tetfon, Sonny Echodo, said Tetfon will continue to support the production of vital textbooks for use in public tertiary institutions. In a statement made available today, Mr. Echono said Tetfon will sustain the partnership with the Nigerian Academy of Education and described Academy as the mother of all academics in the country whose members have been at the forefront of pursuing the dissemination and spread of knowledge and development of skills in children. The debt fund boards noted that textbooks are important assets for a country's growth and catalyst for mental growth and social integration. In Lagos State, a fire outbreak has been reported at the Alaba International Market in the Ojo area of the state. Director, Lagos State Fire and Rescue Service, Adesheye Margaret, said the incident took place this afternoon. He said the fire affected mainly the shanties used the shelves in the popular market. The fire service director said an angry mob prevented the firefighters from getting access to the affected areas to quell the inferno. She, however, said security operatives were on top of the situation, adding that the agency was collaborating with the security operatives to address the situation. However, the Lagos State Police Command said its men raided the shanties around the popular Alaba International Market in the Ojo local government area of the state while acting on credible information. The State Police Public Relations Officer, Benjamin Hondeni, who disclosed this via his Twitter handle, stated that some suspected criminals were arrested after the raid while weapons were recovered from them. SP Hondeni added that the shanties were thereafter set on fire by the police officers. Similarly, a building on the premises of the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission EFC Seasonal Command in Enugu State has been raised by fire. In a statement, AFCC spokesperson Wilson Wajure said the fire which broke out this afternoon was caused by an electric surge. He said the fire was put out by the John Day Fort of the State and Federal Fire Service. The AFCC spokesperson added that no life was lost in the incident. You're watching News at 7 on Western Spring Television, still to come. World Health Organization says COVID-19 no longer represents a global health emergency. We'll bring you more on this when we return. In 1950-1953, pitched North and South Korea against each other in response to intrigues by nations beyond their border with different interests from those canvassed by the two brother nations. The Korean War had all the nuances of an external conflict induced by powers that were interested in subjugating North and South Korea. Japan had leveraged on its military power to annex Korea in 1900 and imposed a military union that did not sit well with the citizens. Japan not only lost its war of conquest against Korea, all its powers were obliterated by the effect of the World War II. The end of World War II got Korea divided into two nations along 38 parallel lines by the instrumentality of the United States of America and the Union of Soviet Socialist Republic. The Korean War lapsed into a Cold War when it stopped the prying eyes of external forces into the internal affairs of a nation now divided along its north and southern territories. Western Spring Television identifies the Korean War as a major event in history. The 1914 Amalgamation Treaty is synonymous to the birth of Nigeria. Frederick Lugard, a British Army captain and an outlaw who struck gold in Africa became the instrument used by destiny to make it happen. The Amalgamation of Nigeria was designed for economic reasons by the colonial administration to offset Northern Protectorate budget deficit by Southern Protectorate surplus returns. The Amalgamation had ab initio created imbalance in the economic 
unique political structure of Nigeria and was responsible for the persistent hiccups in the efforts to forge a united country till today. Nigeria's amalgamation was labeled as the mistake of 1914 by native northern conservatives who neither wanted it nor contributed anything significant to its sustenance. Western Springer Television identifies with Amalgamation Treaty of 1914 as a watershed event in history. Named Mao Zedong at birth, but globally known as Mao Zedong, he was a Chinese revolutionary and founder, People's Republic of China, which he led as chairman of the Chinese Communist Party from 1949 until his death in 1976. He was a communist who believed in the attainment of power by the instrumentality of gun. His wise saying, political power grows out of the barrel of gun, formed the major plank of his revolutionary struggle for the control of China. In the long span of his leadership and political power, Mao Zedong relentlessly entrenched the communist philosophy in China, which emphasized the revolutionary struggle of the vast majority of people against the exploiting class and their state structures. The communist leaders defined the class struggle as people's war. Mao Zedong was a story of grass to grace, having risen from peasantry to preeminent status as China's most respected leader. Western Spring Television identifies Mao Zedong as a major character in history. Yo, welcome back. This is still News at 7, Western Spring Television. A reminder of our headlines. United Kingdom court jails former Deputy Senate President of Nigeria, Ike Ikwerimadu, his wife and a doctor for an organ trafficking plot. Police grant administrative bill to suspended Adamawa State Resident Electoral Commissioner, Hudu Yunusa Ari. And second batch of about 130% evacuated from Sudan arrived in Nigeria. On the foreign scene, World Health Organization says COVID-19 no longer represents a global health emergency. Operatives of the Ibadan Zonal Command of the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission, EFCC, have arrested 40 suspected internet fraudsters. They were arrested on Wednesday in Abeokuta, Ogun State, following intelligence on their alleged cyber fraudulent activities. Items recovered from the suspects include seven exact cars, several mobile phones, laptops, PlayStation video games, Apple wristwatches, and charms. According to the EFCC, the suspects have given useful information and will be charged to court as soon as the, the investigations are concluded. Reactions have trailed the announcement by the Badon Electricity Distribution Company alerting consumers within its franchise area of an imminent blackout from next month over backlogs of unpaid bills. The IBEDC, a part distribution company, said it was planning to disconnect its feeders from the national grid due to poor remittances. Daniel Odemi has the rest of the story. The power sector in Nigeria has encountered heaps of challenges since the state-owned power holding company of Nigeria was privatized in 2013. The latest is a possible blackout in certain states covered by the Ibadan Electricity Distribution Company, IBDC, due to accumulated debt piled up over time as part of unpaid electricity bills from millions of customers within the franchise area. The management of IBDC listed Ogun, Oyo, Kwara, Oshun, and some parts of Niger. Kogi and Ekiti are states that may be affected. Just last week, the transmission company of Nigeria TCN threatened to sanction airing discos over non compliance with market rules, which bother primarily on payment remittances for electricity services. Speaking with WSTV News, Senior Communication Officer for IBDC Oshun Region Kikelomo Oweye enjoined the residents of Oshun State to pay for the power used and stop bypassing electricity meters as such actions 
sabotages the effort of IBDC in remitting revenue to the TCN. And where the problem lies is that most of these communities, there are people that are engaging in illegal connection, illicit meter, energy theft, and uh, vandalism and all of that that could actually lead to um, some kinds of itches that we won't get the accurate amount of money that we've actually turned to that uh, transformer through the energy. However, some residents of Oshobo complained of power irregularity among other issues as reasons for defaulting on electricity payment. Hey, let, let me say the community challenge or the general challenge is this uh, uh, shortage of electricity provision like the hours they used they give now is shorter than the way it used to be. In a reaction, Mrs. Oweya stated the challenges the electricity firm encounters in the business of power distribution and revenue generation. So if we can meet up with our uh, obligations, definitely they want to, to uh, withdraw their services. That is why we are on the verge of uh, being disconnected by TCN. So, and it means that if we are disconnected from the national grid, little or nothing can we do. So we, that's why we are appealing to our customers to make payments. The senior communication officer for IBDC also stated that plans are ongoing to ensure business owners, MSMEs, and production hubs in Oshun State have electricity to power their businesses irrespective of location. Luckily, yesterday we had a meeting with our MD customers, My, that's um, the business owners, maximum demand customers that uh, they are actually using this uh, electricity for their businesses. So a lot of things came up there that has to do with this, and we knew, uh, we, all, we talked about it, and this uh, initiative we're talking about came up, that is the commercial line creation. So if we have that, we know how to now accommodate such people on this line so that it can benefit and it will be to their own benefit and profit to and serve them better. The law of demand and supply seems to be defiled by the challenges the IBDC is going through at the moment with the threat from the Transmission Company of Nigeria to cut the disco off from its grid. Customers are also here at the IBDC office with potpourri of complaints um, from metering to estimated billions and several others. How these issues are going to be solved uh, uh, remains a question to be answered. Daniel Odeemi, Western Spring Television. Former President Goodluck Jonathan has described the late Umaru Musa Yaradwa as an exemplary leader who lived above ethnic and religious sentiments. The late Yaradwa and Dr. Jonathan were elected as President and Vice President in 2007, succeeding Olushe Gnobasujo and Atiku Abubakar. Yara Dua died on the 5th of May 2010 and was succeeded by Jonathan. In a tribute to mark 13 years since his death, Dr. Jonathan said the late Yara Dua was a man of peace, justice and accountability. Similarly, former Vice President Atiku Abubakar described the late former president as a devoted leader and champion of democracy. Atiku said the disease was a beacon of humility and integrity adding that despite his illness, he fought for a better Nigeria and set the path for future leaders. On the foreign scene, the World Health Organization has declared that COVID-19 no longer represents a global health emergency. The statement represents a major step towards ending the pandemic and comes three years after it first declared its highest level of alert over the virus. Officials said the virus death rate had dropped from a peak of more than 100,000 people per week in January 2021 to just over 3,500 on the 24th of April. The head of the WHO said at least 7 million people died in the pandemic. But Dr. Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus said that the true figure was likely closer to 20 million deaths, nearly three times the official estimates and he warned that the virus remained a significant threat. He also warned of that the decision to remove the highest level of alert did not mean the danger was over and said the emergency status could be reinstated if the situation changed. Yesterday, the emergency committee met for the 15th time and recommended to me that I declare an end to the public health emergency of international concern. 
I have accepted that advice. It's therefore with great hope that I declare COVID-19 over as a global health emergency. However, that does not mean COVID-19 is over as a global health threat. At least 70 bodies have been recovered following severe flooding in Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo. There are reports that homes have been flattened by flood water and mudslides in two villages, Bushushu and Iyamu Kubi in South Kivu province. The governor there described it as a catastrophe. In Ituri province, floodings has always destroyed more than 1,000 shelters that had been built for people displaced by war. In neighboring Rwanda, at least 130 people have died in floods and landslides in the north and west. Elsewhere, Serbian police have arrested a gunman suspected of killing eight people and wounding 14 others in a village near Belgrade in the second mass shooting in the country this week. According to the Serbian Interior Ministry, the suspect was apprehended in the vicinity of the city of Krajuvek, Krajujevic. The ministry in a statement said the suspect is believed to have killed eight people and wounded 14 others overnight, adding that investigation was ongoing. In a reaction, Serbia's President Aleksandar Vucic condemned the terrorist attack and proposed tough new gun controls. The shooting in the village of Dubona, near the town of Mladenovac, 26 miles south of Belgrade, was the second in the Balkan country in just two days. And in Britain, King Charles III and the Prince and Princess of Wales have greeted well wishes at the Mall in London ahead of tomorrow's coronation. Charles is due to welcome international dignitaries to Buckingham Palace later. Charles and Camilla, the Queen's consorts, have been attending a final rehearsal as preparations for tomorrow's coronation reach the final stages. Preparations are underway for the coronation of King Charles on May 6, which will mark the inauguration of a new head of state in the United Kingdom after 70 years. On the day of the ceremony, the king will be crowned alongside Camilla, the queen consort, and a host of other events have been planned. An extra bank holiday has been confirmed on Monday, 8 May, to mark the occasion. It promises to be a weekend of splendor and traditions dating back 1,000 years. Today, London and Winter will be having parades, crowds, and street parties to mark the coronation. Large crowds of royal fans are expected to flock to central London for the occasion. On Saturday, which is the coronation day, Westminster Abbey will host the coronation service. Crowds are expected along the Mall, Whitehall and Parliament Square. The viewing areas will be open from 6am. The King's procession from Buckingham Palace to Westminster Abbey will take place before the coronation service, which starts at 11. The service will be followed by the coronation procession from Westminster Abbey to Buckingham Palace. Later in the afternoon, the King and Queen will greet crowds from the Buckingham Palace balcony for the fly fast. But while a sense of joy feels palpable for many, 64% of Britons said they did not care about the upcoming coronation, according to a recent YouGov poll, while 48% said they were unlikely to take part in coronation celebrations. The leaders of Australia and New Zealand will pledge their allegiance to King Charles at his coronation in London on Saturday Today, even though both are lifelong Republicans who do not shy away from making their positions clear. Australian Prime Minister Anthony Albanese and his New Zealand counterpart Chris Hipkins have travelled to London where they are due to meet Prime Minister Rishi Sunak today, although they met the King earlier in the week. Australia held a referendum in 1999 on becoming a republic with 55% of voters opposed. Polls in recent years have shown varying support for a republic, with most showing a small majority of Australians in favour. Although neither Albanese nor Hipkins are actively campaigning for the British monarch to be replaced as head of state, despite their republican conviction, Albanese may it clear it doesn't mean that the institution cannot be respected as is the system of government they have. Albany said he would take the oath of allegiance to King Charles at the ceremony.
King Charles is head of state in Australia, New Zealand and 12 other Commonwealth realms outside the United Kingdom, although the role is largely ceremonial. The two countries are holding events to celebrate the coronation from tree planting to military flypasts, though there is expected to be less pageantry than after the death of Queen Elizabeth last year. The late King's death reignited debate in Australia about the need to return a distant constitutional monarchy. Prince Harry would take the 24-hour trip to London for the coronation while his wife, Meghan Markle, stays back in California. And Harry will be in row five, six, seven, nowhere near his brother or his father. There's no chance for reconciliation during the coronation. There isn't time, and this isn't the time and place. This is the King's Day. Some South Africans are calling for Britain to return the world's largest diamond, known as the Star of Africa, which is set in the royal scepter that King Charles III will hold at his coronation on Saturday, while others said they didn't feel strongly about it. The diamond, which weighs 530 carats, was discovered in South Africa in 1905 and presented to the British monarchy by the colonial government in the country, which was then under British rule. Temi Tope, Achijolalwala, Western Spring Television News. Meanwhile, British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak's conservative losses have mounted in the local election as key battleground results come in. Voters are punishing the conservatives after a year of political scandals, surging inflation and stagnant economic growth. While governing parties often struggle at midterm elections, the council results in England are the largest and last test of voter sentiment before next year's general election. As it stands, Labour Party has won 1,356 seats, with the Conservative winning 1,028, while the Liberal Democrats gained 761 seats. Earlier, Prime Minister Rishi Sunak said despite the results, he was going to keep on carrying out the promises he made to the people. It's always disappointing to these hard-working conservative councillors, their friends, their colleagues, and I'm so grateful to them for everything that they've done. But in terms of the results, it's still early. We've just had a quarter of the results in. Uh, but what I am going to carry on doing is delivering on the people's priorities, halving inflation, growing the economy, reducing debt, cutting waiting lists, and stopping the boats. That's what people want us to do. That's what I'm going to keep hard at doing. Now, the ex-conservative leader of Medway Council blamed the unpopularity of your government, cost of living plans, the planning change, NHS failings. That's all down to you. A clear message from voters. What's going to change? Look, as I said, we've only had a quarter of the results in. Actually, we're making progress in key election battlegrounds like Peterborough, Bassett Law, Sandwell. But the message I am hearing from people tonight is that they want us to focus on their priorities and they want us to deliver for them. And that's about halving inflation, growing the economy, reducing debt, cutting waiting lists and stopping the boats. I'm still ahead. Food and Agriculture Organization says world food prices rose in April for the first time in a year. We have more on this and other business stories after this break. Please stay with us. of December 1910 at Rabba village Sokoto, northwestern Nigeria. His father was a district head and heir apparent to the Sultanate throne from the house of Osmano Danfodio, a religious and social reformer who brought the Haber dynasty under the Fulani Caliphate in the beginning of the 19th century. Ahmadu Bello raised the bar of political consciousness and participation when, in 1944, he engineered the establishment of the Northern People's Congress NPC as the first political party in northern Nigeria and the rallying point for politicians in the region before independence. History will not forget Ahmadu Bello for his charisma and political sagacity which provided easy passage for his kinsmen to assume political and administrative positions in Nigeria's post-independence era. The distinguished elder statesman and Sadaun of Sokoto has his face on his country's 200 naira currency as a mark of honor to one of the architects of Nigeria's independence. Western Spring Television identifies Ahmadu Bello as a watershed character in history. 
Austin. Rolly Hialahia Mandela was an anti-apartheid activist who gave his all for the elimination of what has been described as the world most vicious rule of the unjust and man's inhumanity against man. He was born July 18, 1918 in Mveso, South Africa, educated and trained as a successful legal practitioner. He took up the gauntlet of a human activist against segregation by the minority whites through primitist in South Africa. At the climax of his trial for treason, orchestrated by the minority South African government, the great crusader for democratic equality was prepared to pay the supreme sacrifice to establish majority rule in his native land. He told white jurist that if achieving freedom for his people was worth his life, he was prepared to die. Nelson Mandela spent 27 years in Robin Island, described as the most notorious prison in the world. It was from this same prison that he came out as a free man to assume office as South Africa's first black president in 1994. Western Spring Television identifies Nelson Mandela as a watershed character in history. It was a Euro-American trade in slaves by which 12.5 million Africans were captured from their indigenous homelands and transported via the Atlantic to Europe and the Americas. The transatlantic slave, also known as triangular trade, was the worst form of man's inhumanity to man and the most costly in human life of all long-distance global migrations. Hundreds of Africans chained tightly to plank beds in the belly of slave ships in horrific conditions were transported via the Atlantic and stripped of all human dignity on arrival in Europe and America. It is the greatest crime the Caucasians committed against the black race. It is impossible to discuss the transatlantic slave trade without a copious reference to impoverishment and underdevelopment of Africa and its peoples. The triangular trade left the continent in ruins. Western Springer Television identifies transatlantic slave trade as a watershed event in history. Born Jeremiah Oyeni Obafemi on March 6, 1905. Obafemi Awulowo was a prime architect of Nigeria's independence and most consummate advocate of free education and social welfare in Africa's most populous nation. Erudite politician, thinker and philosopher, Awu was fondly addressed by associates and political colleagues, brought his unique attributes to bear on governance in the defunct western region. He administered as leader of government business and the premier between 1955 and 1958. Obafemi Awolo's premiership witnessed pioneering in the multi-sectoral policy initiatives and execution. The western region under his administration paraded several enviable records. First television station in Africa, first real estate in Nigeria, first high-rise building in Nigeria, first modern sports stadium in Nigeria, first agricultural settlement in Nigeria, first modern civil service secretariat in Nigeria, and first industrial estate in Nigeria. His face is on 100 Naira denomination as a mark of honor for his distinguished services to his country. Western Spring Television identifies Obafemi Awolowo as a major character in history. Hey, welcome back. Now to some business stories. The Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations says world food prices rose in April for the first time in a year. The UN agency said its food price index, which tracks monthly charges in the international prices of commonly traded food commodities, averaged 127.2 points in April of 2023, up 0.6% from March. FAO, however, the index was 19.7% below its level in April 2022, but still 5.2% higher than in April 2021. In the report released today, the agency said the increase in the food price index was driven by higher international quotations for sugar 
meat and rice, which offsets a decline in prices of wheat, maize, dairy products, and vegetables. FAO said the sugar price index rose 17.6% from March, reaching its highest level since October 2021 due to reduced productions of expectations and outcomes in India, China, Thailand, and the European Union. Similarly, the mid price index rose 1.3% in April, driven primarily by higher pig meat quotations, followed by poultry prices which increased amid Asian import demand and production curbs sport by animal health issues. The agency said price in the indices for other major food commodity categories, with the exception of rice, continue their declining trend. Job creation in the United States remained out robust last month, despite turmoil in the banking sector and the impact of higher borrowing costs. In its Friday report, the Labor Department said employers added 253,000 jobs, which was better than many analysts had expected. The unemployment rate fell to 3.4%, returning to a multi-decade low. The gains were a reminder of the resilience of the U.S. labor market, which has held up in the face of aggressive efforts by the U.S. Central Bank to cool the economy. The Federal Reserve has raised its benchmark interest rate from near zero to between 5% and 5.25% in little over a year, an abrupt shift aimed at carbon prices that were soaring last year at the fastest pace in decades. Adidas has said the ending of its collaboration with Kanye West is hot in the business, with sales in North America hard hit. The sportswear giant cut its ties with the designer and rapper late last year after he posted anti-Semitic comments on social media. West design trainers under the Yeezy brand and Adidas said the loss of the business cut sales by 400 million euros in the first quarter of the year. Overall, total revenue fell by 1%. Despite the deep, the figures were better than analysts had been expecting and Adidas said sales were up percent when the impact of the Yeezy business was excluded. And talking sports, Chuba Akum was a double winner at Middlesbrough's 2022-2023 Player of the Year Awards. Borough's first team players and coaching staffs were amongst the guests at the award ceremony at the Riverside. Akum claimed both the prize of Player of the Year as voted for by fans and players Player of the Year Award. It is another highlight in what has been a fairy tale campaign for Akum, who became the first Borough player to hit more than 20 league goals since 1989-1999 season. With 29 goals now to his name in all competitions, he was named Championship Player of the Year. Tottenham interim boss Ryan Mason says goalkeeper and captain Hugo Lloris will miss the final four games of the season because of a tie issue. The 36-year-old former France international has not featured since being withdrawn at halftime in Tottenham's 6-1 defeat at Newcastle on the 23rd of April. Tottenham are seventh in the Premier League going into tomorrow's game, home game match against Crystal Palace. Fraser Forster is likely to deputise after replacing Lloris against Newcastle and starting the club's last two matches against Manchester United and Liverpool. Hugo, uh, Hugo's out for the season, so we had the results back. Obviously disappointing, um, but we, we kind of feared that um, initially. We, we've done some more tests and um, yeah, he won't play again for us this season. Still in England, Sam Allardyce says he wants to complete a trial by emulating fellow veteran managers Roy Huxin and Neil Warnock and still leads United clear of relegation. 25-year-old Huxin has kept Crystal Palace in the top flight, while Warnock, who is 74 years old, led Huddersfield to championship safety. Leeds are 17th in the Premier League, going into Allardyce's first game in charge at Manchester City tomorrow. The former England ball succeeded Javi Gracias earlier this week with just four games left with only goal difference keeping them out of the bottom three.
I, I don't ever see a problem in training because there's no there's no real pressure there like there is in the game. So um, with, the, with the goalkeeper coach working with him, there's, there's 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 nothing you can see to suggest or say anything other than you look at him and he he, he does like all the keepers do together. They go through the routine. You know they are they are a bit daft, a bit mad, aren't they? Because they love doing what they do and. If you did, if you did that for a player, that the outfield player gets would get would get really bored, and but the goalkeepers love it. So and they they're right good pack together, aren't they? You know what I mean? They're like a little family of their own. So uh, that will help him hopefully. But um, you know that that for me lies to be one of the uh, probably the biggest decisions you know, I have to make today. Liverpool will play the national anthem before their game against Brentford tomorrow despite saying they know some fans have strong views on it. The club supporters booed the national anthem before last season's FA Cup final. The national anthem is being played at top flight matches tomorrow to mark the coronation of King Charles III. Liverpool said it will be played in recognition of the Premier League's request to mark the coronation. The Premier League strongly advised clubs across the weekend, this weekend's matches to mark the coronation in some way and suggested some options with the national anthem being won, although there was no mandate to do so. The club's position is my position. It's clear and above. Um, besides that, I said a couple of times, this is definitely a subject which cannot I, I cannot really have a proper opinion about it because uh, I'm from Germany, we don't have a... Uh, king or queen or these kind of things. I'm 55 years old, have really no experience with that. Watching from the outside, it's a nice thing to watch when all the weddings are massive things in Germany, but nobody really knows. It's like watching a movie or in a newspaper because we don't feel that. So that's it pretty much. Um, I'm pretty sure a lot of people in this country will enjoy uh, the coronation. Some will maybe not really uh, be interested and some will not like it. That's it. And that's the, over the whole country. And I think that's all I can say about it. And the rest is my position as the club's position. And that's all of this are. But before we go, here is a recap of our major stories. The United Kingdom court has sentenced former Deputy Senate President of Nigeria, Ike Ekwirimadu, to nine years and eight months in prison for organ trafficking plots, while his wife Beatrice was sentenced to four years and six months, and the medical doctor who acted as a middleman in the plot, Dr. Obina Obeta, was sentenced to 10 years with his medical license suspended. The Nigerian police force has confirmed that the suspended Adamawa State's resident electoral commissioner, Hudu Yunusa Ari, has been granted administrative bail. The second batch of about 130 persons evacuated from Sudan arrived in Nigeria this afternoon. And on the foreign scene, the World Health Organization has declared that COVID-19 no longer represents a global health emergency. Please do follow us on our social media handles on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Western Spring Television. You can also watch us live on our YouTube channel at Western Spring Television. I am Tunde Ido. Good evening.